Welcome to Uplook's 2018 Summer Bible Program. We're studying 16 key salvation terms. As this graphic shows, these words are broken up into four groupings. First, those that describe God's plan from eternity that makes available all spiritual blessings to believers. Then, four that describe the means by which God's salvation is entered into by the believer four that describe the work of God on behalf of the sinner who accepts his offer of salvation, and four that describe practical blessings that are experienced by the sinner upon believing. Today's lesson, God's Preparations for Salvation in Eternity, features foreknowledge. Anyone who opens the Bible knows that one of the biggest words in God's vocabulary is salvation. Salvation is really everything that God has for us in Christ. So when we think about salvation, we understand that this is not a simple subject. Thankfully, the gospel can be presented simply, and people can understand that Christ died for their sins, and he calls on them to agree with his diagnosis that they are a guilty sinner, incapable of saving themselves, deserving of the wrath of God, but that Christ on the cross took our sin upon himself, paid the debt, and by simply confessing him as our Savior, receiving him as our Savior, uh, the transfer occurs in which our sin is paid in full and we receive in exchange what's called the righteousness of God, which is a faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at these glorious statements about these spiritual blessings that we enjoy, of course we want to understand what they mean. And in order to understand, we have to have a good working definition for these words. And we have to ask, in what sense is this word being used? So, when we use a word like salvation, we not only have to understand the basic idea behind salvation, but in what context the word is being used. Now let's begin with the word foreknowledge. Uh, We're familiar with the Greek word, it's the word prognosis, and the idea is to know before. And if we were to turn to 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, we would say that The word can be used in a common sense as well as in a theological sense. Here Peter writes, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, and he goes on to give them an exhortation, since you know this beforehand, this is the word prognosis. This is the idea of foreknowledge. Now, if we turn to Peter's first epistle, and uh, his introduction as he writes to the scattered saints, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. He writes in verse 2, and the, the King James and New King James both read it this way, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And maybe that translation has a little bit of bias in it, because the word elect actually belongs much earlier in the sentence to the elect pilgrims. That's how the text reads. To the elect pilgrims of the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now this word foreknowledge, of course, is what some call a concession to our humanity. Um, We don't believe that God was way back there looking way up here. God dwells in the eternal now. As the scripture says, he inhabits eternity. And so the idea that uh, the Lord uh, would look through the corridors of time is something to help us who ourselves are encapsulated in time. But the idea is that before the creation of the world, and scientists object to this idea, how can you talk about before time? Uh, 
but we know as Christians that before time there was eternity and God existed in eternity and he made plans in eternity that were going to not only affect time but affect our eternity once we leave this world and step into God's eternity. And so when we read that God foreknew, the idea is that when God planned the ages, when he designed his great scheme, he had all facts on hand. He knew about the rebellion of Satan. He knew about the fall of Adam. He knew about the intransigence of Israel. He knew about the rejection of the Messiah and his crucifixion. And he knew concerning these Christians how they would be treated in that world. The Lord Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. He warned them of this. He knew what was going to happen. And sitting there on the Mount of Olives one day, he spread out before his disciples the whole conclusion of the matter. He showed to them how the story on earth was going to end. So God knew these things before. Now, that does not mean that God made all of these things happen, as some people falsely assume. If I know, for example, uh, beforehand that my wife will kiss me when I come home from a long trip, the fact that I know she will do it, there's a long history of experience here, in no means is suggesting that I make her kiss me. If I do, there's nothing to it. No, it's her volitional act, but the fact that I know it beforehand, just like these believers, as Peter writes to them and says, you know this beforehand, and there are things we can know before. So likewise, God knew it all beforehand. And the idea that he knew that we would put our trust in Christ, and on that basis then, he designed a strategic role for us to play in his plan. Now this is an amazing blessing. There will be no token jobs in heaven. Here's a broom, just sweep the golden street. <laughs> Every one of us is going to have a role for which we were designed. The apostle Paul writing to the Ephesians says, you can't be saved by good works, but you were saved unto good works, which God designed before that you should walk in them. And what you're doing at the present time is training for reigning. So when we look at these words and we read about God knowing beforehand of these matters and on that basis determining his elective scheme, in other words, God choosing us not to be saved, but choosing us for a role in his plan. This is amazing. This is glorious, ladies and gentlemen, that we can take a hold of this idea that God, having all facts on hand and knowing that you would put your trust in Christ, he then began before you were born to weave your DNA and develop in you a certain personality and capabilities and then life experiences. You remember how Jeremiah objected to the Lord and said, I, I, I'm not good at speaking. This isn't, this isn't a, a job for me. And God said, before I formed you, I knew you. I designed you. In your mother's womb, I already was working. Now, this doesn't mean that God has somehow selected a few people out of the human race uh, to be uh, their personal God and to, and to favor them in some special way. The Apostle Paul says, I was separated from my mother's womb. What does that mean? It means that the Apostle Paul, had God had foreknown that he would, when given the opportunity, when having Christ revealed to him, would positively respond to the offer of salvation. And on that basis, God then began to work from the beginning, from the start of his life. The fact that he was born into a Jewish home, but that he was not born in Jerusalem. He was born surrounded by Greek and Roman culture. That he would be fluent in both Hebrew and Greek. 
that he would be trained by Gamaliel and be an expert in the Hebrew scriptures. And all of the circumstances of his life, God was working them for good. Not that God was making it happen. God didn't make Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. He didn't make Potiphar's wife betray him and have him thrown into prison. Behind it all, the devil was scheming to destroy the messianic line. But what happened? As Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So that when you get to glory, you step into this new role, and we'll look at that in a subsequent visit. You will feel the, that all the cogs are meshing, that this is what you were designed for. And you will worship God that all the mistakes and mishaps and failures and weaknesses of your life were simply the means by which God refashioned you to be exactly the person he wants you to be in the world to come.